Life Management Science Labs would like to acknowledge that we live and produce this podcast on the traditional lands of the Wurundjeri people. We'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands of our listeners and our international colleagues. We'd like to pay our respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Hey everyone, and welcome to All Together, the Family Science Insights Podcast, produced by LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. We are champions of life management science, providing structured insights informed by science and inspired by practice on key aspects of conscious living. Each week, we bring you scientific and practical insights on each element with the expert knowledge of professionals in the field. I'm your host, Dina Sargent. Now, let's get started. Hey guys, and welcome back to another episode. So on The Family Show, we've spoken a lot about relationships and also family interactions, but not a lot on the building of a family. So today we're going to introduce the topic of childbirth. And who better to help us define the topic than childbirth educator, counselor, and doula, Ria Dempsey. Thank you so much for joining me today, Ria. So happy to be here and talking to you, Dina. Um, so could you tell me what the role is of a childbirth educator? Yeah, so really just generally with couples when they may be mid-pregnancy or a little bit towards the end, um, educating particularly around the birth process itself and yeah, how maybe something physical as well as um, looking at their fears and concerns and the woman and the and the partner and really educating also about what's happening in the birth culture and the sort of choices that they might make. So that's pretty well what we do as childbirth educators. Well, that sounds, it sounds very in-depth and it sounds very intimate and personal because I think everyone has very different experiences and fears and different questions as well. So can I ask, what's some of the strangest question that you've probably gotten from someone? I mean, it surprises me still that um, given all the information that's out and about in all sorts of, you know, whether it's books or videos or online or what have you, that there are still some people who don't really fully understand how how much the mother can do and how that process is her body and how her body works as opposed to something that's done to her in terms of, you know, the of the medical options or the the things that might happen in the in the hospital that can be done to her. So I can't think of specific questions with that that sort of general take on I guess for some women they feel like it's all done by somebody else mm-hmm. rather than what it is that they how their bodies work and what they can do and that they're not really understanding. And so as an educator I'd love to to really inform about what's going on with the hormones and how the body works and what the mother can do to work with her body and her baby and so on. So that's the things that surprise me the most still in, you know, now and uh, where things are at in our culture now. Yeah, well, wow. so you're joining me, you're in Australia as well. So whereabouts in Australia are you joining me from? So I'm in Melbourne in uh, the state of Victoria, sort of down the bottom part of, of Australia. Yes, yes. So we're both in the same in completely the same uh, state. So that is amazing. Um, so now you've written two books. You're author of both Birthing and Confidence and Beyond the Birth Plan. Um, thank you so much for sending these over. By the way, they were. I actually didn't realize how much of an interest I would find after reading them and in childbirth and knowing the um, the process that takes place and the emotions that sort of come through, it's such, it feels like such a personal story and especially the way that you've written it. I loved seeing everyone's different experiences through these different topics, whether it's the um, birthing in a hospital or birthing at home, everyone has a different story. And it was so nice to be able to find stories and relate them back to a lot of other people, a lot of my friends who have gone through pregnancies and childbirth as well. So thank you so much for sending those over. Mm -hmm. I'm more than happy to. Um, As you'll know from the book, you know, that I've been 
a childbirth educator and a doula for nearly 45 years now. And um, I've been at, it's like 1,500 births, something like that, a bit over that. So, you know, I'm fully immersed, fully immersed. And um, in more recent years, since the books have come out, you know, really just talking about these issues in much more depth as well. So mm-hmm. I'm very pleased that you have, you know, delighted in hearing some of those stories, that rich range of stories in there. Yeah. Yes. No, I, I really enjoyed them. Um, so before we get deeper into talking about the topic, because I know I can get caught up in every topic that sort of comes around the show, we're going to go and start with a little icebreaker, a little get to know you before we get into know the topic you're here to talk about. So when I ask you this question, just go ahead and share the first thing that sort of comes to your head. Yeah. Right. So the first one is a favorite book of yours. Oh, yes. I, um, when I think about books at the moment, apart from you know, the hard work of writing my own, but I think particularly what I'm reading at the moment and sharing widely um, relates to a huge thing that's happening here in, in Australia over these next few months. And this is um, what's called the, the voice to parliament of the Indigenous people, the First Nations people here in Australia, Australian Aboriginals. And it's there's going to be a referendum around whether we say yes to having a voice to parliament in a chain, you know, putting that in the constitution. So it's a big... It's a big social and cultural question that's being asked. And um, I'm reading a few of the books that really lay that out in terms of the, yeah, how and why to have conversations about it and what the importance is and what will be the great benefits to us as Australians. So um, the particular book that I'm reading is the Voice to Parliament Handbook, which gives us lots of information and particularly to have conversations with other people around this huge issue, which is very dear to my heart as well. So that's when I think about a book at the moment, that's really what I'm totally immersed in. Wow. That's, it's a very deep topic and a very, there's a whole wide range of different views. So it's really nice to sort of see everyone's opinion and sort of read through the whole history of it as well. Cause I think we get caught up in the politics of it. We forget the history. Yes. Yes. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Uh, moving on to the next question, which is a favourite movie of yours. Okay. Um, so many, but in fact, what I'm going to talk about, I can't help myself, is to talk. <laughs> <laughs> um, in Australia here, we've made over, a number, let's say the last 10 years, two quite powerful um, movies about birth. And one of them was more or less exactly maybe 12 years ago called The Face of Birth. And then just maybe four years ago, um, it was a movie called Birth Time. And these movies are looking at some of the contemporary issues in the birth culture and the sort of choices that women might make and how they might be supported and yeah, a lot of the sort of political as well as the sort of emotional and psychological issues that relate to how birth works and how it works in our culture. And I've, you know, been very privileged to have a small little bit of a chat in both of those videos, so those those movies which have then gone around a lot. So, um, yeah, they're both powerful movies. And if, well, hopefully there are lots of pregnant women, pregnant couples listening to this podcast and maybe they'll just go and hunt down those movies if they haven't already seen them because they're very, really, as childbirth educators, they're excellent educational material, but also, um, I mean, you're just going to cry, you know, you're going to see these babies born, you're going to want to just snuggle up those babies or your own baby or so on. So um, that's my thing for movies. Okay, well, that's, it's it's very, it's a very passionate job of yours then to be able to sort of relate back to the topic and to your work as well. It's such a, I can definitely see the passion in you when you're talking about it. So it's, it's very nice to see. Uh, the next one is your favorite podcast that you've listened to. Okay. And again, I mean, I actually don't, I'm not a natural podcast listener, but I've been on a number of podcasts. And again, in the, the, 
Perth scene, there are a number of Australian sort of based podcast that really are looking very deeply at some of the issues that in terms of choices and outcomes of birth and so on. And one of them, it's in such a great title. So one of them is called the Midwives Cauldron. And um, like a play on the idea of midwives as witches, you know, and that we're stirring the cauldron. So um, they really look, there are two midwives involved in that and they're really looking deeply at yeah, the interventions and intervention rates and choices and how the birth culture here works and um, really with and, and with good fun in all of that as well. Yeah. So the midwives called. Okay. Well, that it sounds it sounds very interesting, and I think I I love the spin that they took on that as well. So it's no, that's very cool. Uh, the next one is a famous role model that you have. Okay. So. Um, as a childbirth educator, there's a woman, she, she's passed away now, she comes from England, her name's Sheila Kitzinger. She, she was first off a, an anthropologist and it was through, you know, with that lens of her studies um, and then having her own babies, she, she really mm, did lots of work talking about, you know, how how the physiological process of birth is affected by what's happening in the particular cultures where women are giving birth and the, the ways that through that anthropological lens. And so I've met her a number of times. She, as I say, she's passed away, but she is a strong role model for what a childbirth educator can do. And probably also from my point of view about the what can be good and useful about writing about these things. So, yeah, darling woman, Sheila, Sheila Kitzinger. Well, she, she sounds like a very, very inspirational person. So that is, um, that is amazing, the amount of impact she probably made to the world as well. So, yeah. Uh, the last question is, what about a course that you've completed? So... The courses that I have completed were completed quite some time ago. Um, I, I trained as a childbirth educator, but I was a teacher, a physical education teacher, an outdoor adventure sort of facilitator. So that was um, many, many, many years ago. Um, then more recently, even so this is still quite some time ago, um, 20 years ago, I did counselling and psychology and including gestalt therapy. So all of those things sort of come together in my work now as a as somebody working in birth or commenting on about birth and so on. So they would be the courses, but I think really most of my knowledge in this this space about birth is the course of being at birth and seeing how it all works and being in the sort of the hot energy of it being around and of course then there's the beautiful thing of those babies being born and everybody just falling in love and so that's the course it's a course of life really well that it sounds like the best course to be a part of actually <laughs> I think it's something that everyone can sort of relate to and I love I love that last answer so that is that is great well now you're joining me on the family show today and we usually talk about I think I said earlier we usually talk about relationships and family interactions. I know that family is a whole big part of life, whether you whether you like it or not, some family is just family. But according to you, what do you think that your definition of family would be? Um, it's not a simple question. <laughs> Neither is it a simple answer because what I'd like to do as a sort of a roundabout way of coming to, to that answer is to, from my point of view, you know, having been in this world, I mean, really giving birth, one part of central to, to family and family life, not the only thing, of course, but there can be families without that aspect. But... Um, because I've been involved, as I say, for this 45 years, then I've seen not only the changes across that time in terms of how family is thought of and how 
people in ACT, their families, as well as the sort of challenges that can come in terms of when babies come into a relationship that then we feel like then that creates this wider family. So um, when I think about, if I'm thinking about a definition, then of course there would be a social definition, which might be something like, you know, people who feel like they want to be together, to be responsible to one another, to be caring with one another, to be connected to one another. And I guess in this more contemporary time, maybe people might think about that in terms of their chosen family. If we think about it, though, through this you know, long, sweet sweep of human history, then family has really always been around that the sort of biological connections in terms of families and the generations moving through. And I think probably in contemporary life, you know, we we're taking a little can be taking a little bit from all of those aspects. Um, and for many people, of course, it's that it's that biological set of connections and mothers, fathers, children, then the next generation and the next generation. So, being at birth, of course, I'm right in the just right in that glorious sort of energy of the, those big shifts. Um, but also, what I think of through these years, and of course this is being documented much more, and I do refer to it in one of my books, this that second book, um, that the expectations about family in relation to having children is that we've seen a big change in particular about women's roles. So I guess it in Australia, I don't know if this translates to other countries, but in Australia, we might think about you know the fifties model of once children come into a family that the mother is at home looking after the children and the the father is at work, and so that might be what we call a sort of a traditional model in the social context. Um, some families, even further back than that, were more extended families, so that a number of generations were all living together as quite a tight family group. Um, since then, we've you know we've moved much more to a place of sort of like nuclear families, where it's the the couple and those children, hopefully with you know connections to other generations, but maybe not all living together. So it's more that living situation. Um, what we're finding in this more recent time, though, is that uh, the that the couple and their children, this is, you know, they're they're, they're saying that really we're now looking at that as being only about fifty percent of family systems now, because the the language that's used around it is this is about sort of wider cultural and contemporary social issues is this idea of relational vulnerability or relational fragility so that, you know, that idea about, like, I guess when we think about some of the, the if I'm thinking about the 50s, you know, those, those were marriages that last for 20, 30, 40, 50s, my own parents, you know, 60, nearly 70 years. Um, so we don't see that so much now in the more contemporary time and that the this has an impact then in terms of how the family systems, when, fam, fam, when children come into that, then how those family systems are cha- shaped. Mm-hmm. And um, some of that research over these last you know, five or so years is that... Um, that sort of what we might call the sort of traditional role of mum and dad or dad at work and and the mother at home looking after the baby, before the babies are born, before the first baby is born in the couple relationship, then they're both at work and they're both thinking in terms of having their own independence but sharing that life together, whether they're married or not. Um, but there's a big change that happens and and again, as a childbirth educator, I'm aware of this, that a lot of couples feel like, well, once the baby's born, then, then they're going to be sharing all these different things together, yeah? Um, and they'll each be still equals in terms of how they designate roles and so on with the, within their, their relationship and the living situation and so on. But what the research says is that more or less 80% 
or so of couples, once that first baby is born, revert back to that sort of older model, if you like, of mother at home and father at work, or if it's a um, same-sex couple, then the, the other mother of the baby back at work, um, and that role of the mothering in all of its beauty but also its challenge is falling again back to the woman um, and but the social sort of expectation is not that that would happen mm -hmm. what we're also finding is that after the birth of the first baby this is the most fragile time actually of a couple relationship this is often when that 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 breakup is happening because the women are expecting to be more to be sharing much more of the role of of the parenting, um, and maybe still that deep model in us is still that idea of the fifties model. So there's a reason back to that, even though couples are really wanting to shape a different model. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think the, the the stats are something like, you know, there's only less than 2% that change to sometimes the opposite with the father at home and the mother going back to work. Um, and only something like about 4 or 6 to 6% 6 of couples are really doing that shared parenting and shared working model. So mm -hmm. these are that, that birth of that first child particularly, but then if you have a few more, then... In contemporary social context, even though the whole process of pregnancy and birth is, you know, for, for how long have we been birthing ourselves as human beings? Um, but some there's some big shifts in the social structures that are impacting in the the ways families are formed and the ways they hold together or not, and how that all works. So it's, um, yeah, it's a big topic. Yes, no, it is. It's. it's, it's it's really big and I think everyone has a very different definition as to how they see family and how they see a connection with people and I think you were mentioning a little bit earlier when it comes to family as it can be chosen family it can be a family that we're born into and I think everyone has from what I hear everyone that I've interviewed has the exact same answer and it's very interesting to see that no one everyone describes it in a very similar way and everyone sees it as such a interesting um like universal definition even though there is no definition for family somehow that ends up being the exact definition so it's it's very interesting to me now we're talking about childbirth today and we're talking about pregnancy and um things that go into making your family a little bit bigger uh, in terms of the connection that you have. And I think you introduced that really well just then when we we're talking about making your family wider and the different roles and responsibilities that sort of come about. Based on your extensive experience, what are some of the common concerns and fears that families express during the childbirth process? So... If we're making, you know, broadening the childbirth process to the pregnancy and well, maybe, you know, even the contemplation about will we get pregnant and when will we get pregnant and have the, have the babies. Mm -hmm. so, of course, one of them, just to flow on from that, my last answer, can be the social context about how will our lives change, particularly with that first baby. So there can be delights about that, about how the, that their lives will change, but also concerns about how that how that will change in terms of some of these things that I've already mentioned in terms of how the household and the duties in the household and so on will work, but also then how work and, um, yeah, what sort of support they'll have around. So that's sort of a bit more in the social context of, of having those babies. And then, of course, there's also the concerns about, you know, how will, how will our baby be? Will our baby be healthy? Will our health baby be well? And then also how will the birth go and how will that be for the mother and how that what sort of support does she need? And so that's looking at it from a sort of a health medical point of view, but then also from the point of view of the sort of dynamics in the relationship and how they, because now, of course, we've come to a place that in pretty well across the world, not entirely, but certainly sort of westernized countries, 
if the father of the baby is going to be part of the ongoing life of the baby, the expectation is that they will be at the birth and be giving that support to the woman as she's birthing the baby. Um, it's not a, it's not yet one full generation in, mind you. So it's as a as a human sort of social experiment. It's still still unfolding. Um, but that is the expectation, certainly for for us here in Australia, um, that yeah the father will be present at the birth if if he's going to be involved through through the child's life. Um, so there's a whole set of wonderful things that can happen with that, but also there's some some there can be challenge and concern about how that will go, and maybe because there are some things to talk, talk about that in relationship to outcomes of the birth, and maybe we'll get into that as a part of a chat a bit later on. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, these are the things that are that are. I, I guess for the for the dads, they're often will you know will I will I know what to do? Will I be emotionally strong enough to to be bear witness? And from the birthing woman's point of view, of course, there's the fears about. Yeah, will the baby be okay, and will I be okay, and how will I manage it, and how will I be present to it? So, it's quite a lot going on in terms of that yeah. preparation. Yeah, yeah, and I think especially when it comes to the fears, and I think we were talking about fears a little bit earlier. There's going to be fears on both sides, on both the birthing woman and then the people that are sort of taking care of her as well. Um, especially the "Am I ready?" sort of conversation and am I ready to be a father? Am I ready to be a mother? Am I ready to take care of someone that's not myself? Um, So in speaking of that, how do you start to be ready for pregnancy even before you're even pregnant? Yeah. So, I mean, again, we know much more about this and, and I would think that most women, most couples would be aware of the mother preparing her body Pre, pre-pregnancy in terms of some of the things to stop doing and some of the things to to maybe increase her health and well-being to to really feel like that baby is going to be you know beautifully healthy and ready for the world so there are some of those preparations I think also there's preparations for some couples to start you know shifting a little bit in terms of their not necessarily their friendship groups but I mean widening their their networks to if they're not already in networks where there are friends and family who've got who have already got children, that then they're sort of on the hunt a little bit for, well, what does it look like on the other side? And so some of that is part of what they might be preparing in in sort of subtle or if not really quite strong ways before they get pregnant. And then of course there's there's the um, you know finding the, when's the best time and all of those things. So that's. Yeah, those are the things that really play into that in the preparation. I mean, we we have thought about that in particular about women really preparing their bodies to you know to grow the baby, but we know much more now that actually fathers and the quality of their sperm and so on is really affected too by their lifestyle choices and so on. So, so it's probably a pre-pregnancy preparation for both of them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there must be that emotional talk as well, being like, especially if one person is ready, the other person feels like they're not, there's going to be like that huge, um, that huge setback in terms of, okay, I'm ready, but the person I'm with isn't ready. And there's that huge waiting period. Cause I, I mean, you get told every day, you can't ever truly be ready to go through it. Even though you say you are, there's still that fear and that doubt and things that sort of come about. And I think especially in terms of like, I have a lot of friends who went through that pregnancy, who went through childbirth and they're like, you're never going to be prepared. I read every book. I read everything online. I had everything that they said I needed to have, but I still was not prepared for the amount of fear that I have. And there's that whole, I think I just mentioned it as well. There's that whole, okay, I'm responsible for this raising this thing, this child, this person that's not myself. And it's it comes at a huge shock for a lot of people. Like for a lot of my friends who 
we're pregnant, they were like, I, the amount of fear that I have that I'm going to ruin this child is intense. Mm -hmm. So how do you get over that fear? And I think you mentioned the kind of fears that happens in your book as well, but what kind of fears usually take place that can be that do that you have experienced through other people that, that have that you've attended during their childbirth. So I mean I think the you know the the big overall one is of course will the baby be healthy and well. And I think there's a you know you know when when the baby is when the mother is first has the baby the baby comes out and she's receiving her baby one of the things if they're not disturbed one of the things that they just so immediately do is they, they sort of smell their baby, they look at their baby, they're cuddling their baby, they're holding their baby. So these some of these things are very deeply primal. Um, and so something about the smell of the baby is part of the bonding process. So the mother knows that this is my baby, as does the, ba the baby knows the smell of the mother because the baby has been swallowing some of the am amniotic fluid and gets a sense of... Um, you know, the taste of that. And so that gives the baby a sense of the baby smell. So they're, they're bonding through smell. But one of the other things that mothers do in those first few minutes usually is, as they're snuggling that baby, is that they're looking at the fingers and the toes. And I think that this can relate to that one of those big fears, is my baby going to be okay? You know, is my baby well and healthy? And I would think that something quite primal is to you know, the five thing, you know, the 10 fingers, 10 toes, um, as an outward form of, you know, yeah, the baby, it's, it's, it's good. It's okay. So you see that as a, um, just quite a, I think it's a sort of a deeply embedded primal sort of examination of the baby. How is the baby? So that's one thing that I see that relates to, I think those fears that we might all have. Mm -hmm. Then of course, it's a different a different um, thing to be to be um, having those fears about well how will I parent and how will I how will I shake this baby and will I will I will we be beautiful influences will we or will we you know just do terrible things to these this ch child because we don't know enough or we so that's uh, I'm pretty sure that has been an a generational old age, you know, through many generations, contemplation. And I guess that what it does is it opens us to like really attuning to what we feel is important in our own values and our, our own lived experience and causes us to reflect and to ponder and to make some shifts and changes in our, and also educate ourselves about what how to be with babies, and and that's probably maybe because we're no no longer living so much in these extended families where we would be before we had our own first child, we would be exposed to you know other other babies being born into that extended family network, and so that you're witnessing and seeing and maybe even being part of the care, caring of these ba your other babies as the auntie or the older brother or the older sister or what have you, whereas, you know, now in this sort of a bit more tightly formed couple with baby, um, maybe then you really you're not don't have so many much of the role models or what have you, and there's really a, a big education process to to equip yourself to not only for the birth but for the early time with the baby and breastfeeding, but then, oh, for the 50 years of parenting that's going to come come later. So, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I, I take that sort of fear that couples would have or the mother would have about what sort of parent will I be, will I know how to do it all. I take that as a, I mean, that's a good thing because it's, I mean, if fears tip right over, then of course that can be problematic. But it's it's like to have some concern, to have some, it's like that's a motivating factor for looking at yourself and looking at the situation and really getting up to speed with what is important and reflecting on the things that you want to change or shift in yourself and how you might want to open more into a different way of being given that you're going to be with this baby and so on. So some of the fears, I would think that some of the fears have always 
you know, generation by generation have been there. Some of those fears can be soothed a little bit depending on how close you are around other couples or family members who are having babies. Um, but it's part of our human nature to feel like we're improving, you know, that we're mm-hmm. developing. And so that sort of twinge of fear, how will I be? Would we be okay? Will I be okay? Will we, will we be good enough? Is part of that motivation to to really do that preparation. Now, a lot of your roles sort of take place in sort of the emotional connection between emotional alleviation with the birthing woman, especially during that process. And I always really wanted to know the difference between a doula and a midwife, because there would be some similarities in the roles that sort of takes place. But what why is it sort of classified as two different things? Well, certainly midwives um, have, you know, they're doing their their training involves a whole lot of medical understandings that come out of them. I mean, there's a midwifery, a long history of midwifery, of course, but then there's also a combining of that with with yeah. medical aspects about how the body works and how so on. Doulas are not involved in that aspect of knowing what to do with blood pressure or this or that, all of those checks and balances that, that are letting us know that the mother's body and the baby's body are, are doing fine. Doulas are really in that sort of social support, um, as you're saying, you know, emotional support, maybe knowledge in, in terms of how to work with a contraction or how to be with a contraction or so on, but there, there's a very clear divide. in. So generally, so doulas would be working, certainly in my, my life, there will be... And I've done a lot of work in the home birth scene, but not only in the hospitals as well. So there are always midwives and sometimes also obstetricians are involved who are watching over the body systems, the baby's body systems, the heartbeats and all of those things. And as a doula, I'm more attuned, may know a little bit more about, you know, if there are particular deep fears or um big challenges that are going to be faced by the woman or the couple, you know, when the baby comes or so on. Maybe maybe the doula knows a bit more about some of those things. And if she can feel that the mother is going into a place of some fear or resistance or what have you, then, then we might step into that to, you know, encourage a releasing of, it might be a releasing of anger, it's often a releasing of tears or it's, you know, and so in that emotional realm, and as well, doulas probably, um, although the, many midwives have these skills as well, so it sort of depends on, maybe I'll talk a little bit about some of the differences in different philosophies within midwifery, um, but there are quite a lot of massages and movements and particular positions that mothers can get into to smooth the way that the labour goes and to work with that energy running through her body. So doulas are certainly usually doing aspects of that. So the comfort measures, if you like. Um, midwives also, not necessarily all midwives, but a lot of midwives have those skills as well. And of course, um, both the midwife and the doula are doing a bit of a, a um, maybe it's like a relay race, not really a relay race, but you know we're passing the baton. So sometimes the, the father or the other mother of the woman or the other you know, maybe the grandmother or, or some of the close friends are uh, doing some dancing, birth dancing with the mother or eye contact and beautiful loving engagement to support her on. But then maybe it gets, either can get tiring because often it's a long thing or maybe the partner is getting caught up in sort of emotions in themselves and not quite able to stay strong for the mother. And so then... Maybe they might step back or step out and have a cup of tea or something and somebody like me might come a bit more strongly into being with the mother in a stronger way and being with her. In in particular, I talk a lot about this idea that during a labor as it's, you know, the intensity is building, building, building. And there are particular key points in a labor where women, where there's like a big jump up in the in the intensity of the energy. And I call these <clears throat> these moments crises of confidence. Because when they happen, women are generally feeling, particularly in our birth culture where women are giving a sort of a, 
a subtle and not so me- subtle message that really they can be comfortable and perhaps they should be comfortable through the whole thing. Mm-hmm. Whereas if certainly the women that I'm working with are women who I would call willing women who want to have a go at working with their body and the physiology and so on. So the design of a labor is that it intensifies, intensifies, intensifies in terms of how close together the contractions come, how long they last, how the hard work that they're doing in the body. And so as those and the hormones flooding through to intensify the whole thing. So if women are going into those crises of confidence where they're falling apart a bit or they're whinging or they they don't want to do it anymore or they don't know how they can do it anymore or they're wanting all the drugs and so on. Um, so partners can sometimes feel like that's very challenging. But maybe the, the doula or the midwife can step into that because they've seen it before and they can hold the mother through you know, maybe it's four or five contractions, helping her get to get back in rhythm with her breathing and to so- soften and surrender and sort of relax into that that harder work and then she gets on a new groove and so then we would sit back and have a cup of tea and then the couple get together and you know start the partner comes into that you know that different groove and is able to to continue with that support so it's a bit of a change you know changing partners depending on some aspects that are unfolding during the labor okay yeah, all of those things. I think I've broadened out my answer to your your question. No, it leads very well into the next question that I was going to ask. And, and it's like how the involvement of partners and other family members, sort of how much does that impact a the overall childbirth experience for, for everyone involved? It's a beautiful question. So... We have to think about it a bit really across the longer span of us as human beings and then think about what's happening in the contemporary situation. Mm-hmm. So really through millennia, um, women have been supported by other women, other women who have who are experienced in childbirth and some with the special knowledge of mid- midwifery or herbs or what have you, but certainly it's been a women's space of experienced women giving that support to the, the new mother who's giving birth to this baby. The presence of the fathers of the baby, I mean, I'm of the generation where we started to bring our partners into the birth space. So my first child was born in the in the late 70s, and so it was sort of in the mid-70s that this started to take place. And now, as I said before, pretty much in countries where men are present in birth space, it's expected that the dad will be at the birth. So as I come to understand it in some of the other issues that come forward and the shifts and changes in our social life, is that since fathers have been, pre- and the research sort of backs this up, that since fathers have been present at birth, this is really changing fathering out of sight. It's bringing such a beautiful softness and this shift from fathers sort of thinking themselves as being provider fathers who are a bit separate from the kids to actually these nurturing fathers who just fall in love with those babies and want to just be holding them and carrying them in the slings and carrying them in it. So that, that rise of the nurturing father is, um, which isn't to say that, you know, fathers have not loved, they've loved their babies, but just the role has, has been played out in a different way. So the fathers present at birth then tend to be, yes, more hands-on with, with the care of the baby after the baby's born. Mm-hmm. However, so that's a beautiful thing. Yeah. And as I said before, though, it's not even really one full generation in. Yeah. When I do my workshop, you know, I ask, who, who of you know that your dad was there when you were born? And, you know, there's still yeah, two thirds would say, yeah, yeah, definitely dad was there. Um, and some people know that wasn't there. So, yeah, so that's still shifting. Um, however, the, the downside of fathers being present at the birth is, and just hold that thought because I have to say something else to to make it really come clear. Mm -hmm. First of all, I, the women that I work with and the work that I 
do is around women who really want to work with their bodies and their the physiology and their babies to to have a, what we nowadays call a normal physiological childbirth. So those women are women that I call willing women. They want to have a go. They want to have a go at working with their body and their baby to birth their babies. Um, women don't have to do that if they don't want to. You know, we have birth culture now that that you can have an induction, you can have this, the elective season. You, we can make those choices. I'm talking about my my experience in terms of my work is that I'm generally working with women who want to engage and want their partners and so all of that. So in the context then of willing women that I would work with um, who want to engage with that process, they need to find the support to be able to engage with the intensity of the labor. I mean, that's a lovely word, intensity. Really, basically, we're just talking about the functional sort of physiological pain of their body working to open and release their baby. Mm -hmm. Um, This is part of that deal for that normal physiological childbirth. And so who is with the mother to support her? So what we need are people who've got some experience, so we'll talk about the doula situation that I've talked about, but we also need people around, surrounding that mother who can encourage her into being brave rather than feeling they want to save her, that they want to save her from the hard work of it or to save her from the strong contractions, which can be done, you know, with the epidural or the, the drug processes, or are they people who know and trust that, yes, it's a, it's a tough gig, but it's possible and these are the things that can be done to support you and to help you to work with that and to encourage her into her strength and her bravery about being in that strong engagement with her body. Mm-hmm. So coming back to the fathers. So this, a lot of fathers want to encourage the the brave and to support all of that, but at some of those crucial moments, what I call crises of confidence, a father, a male, doesn't really have any credibility with that laboring woman when she's feeling like it's too much and he's saying, oh, but yeah, you're doing so good and blah, 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 because has he, he doesn't have the credibility that her sister who has already given birth might have, or her mother who's given birth, or the midwife or the doula or so on. So there's something about that in that role that makes that quite difficult for partners to hold that space. And they often are getting not worried, but also caught up in a sympathy loop with the mother about the poor thing, what she's having to do. And so that dynamic can lead then to you know, the pain relief and so on coming in, and particularly the epidural where everybody can be very comfortable and just watching telly together and not needing that emotion work Mm -hmm. of the sort of deeper engagement. So what we know is since, and it's more complex than I'm going to say, but what we know since fathers have been present in birth is that the intervention rates have been going through the roof. I think that some part of that is around what happens around this the pain issue and how we either support women to continue on and to work with the way the hormones work to support her or whether there is this sort of feeling of that it's all too difficult to witness or it feels very distressing to the, to the partner, the father in particular we're talking about, and that they want it to be calmed down or to to save her or so on. So <clears throat> these are some of the things that not only me, other researchers are talking about this as well, but certainly I talk about it in my books, yeah. Mm-hmm. So what? how would you define what intervention is? For those who don't know and haven't read your book, how would you sort of define what that process goes? Yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, what I'm going to do is just... Um, give you a little bit of a heads up about what the stats are saying about the interventions in, in birth in Australia now. Okay. Yeah? Yeah, go for it. Good. But first of all, to say, certainly any and all of the interventions in birth, all of them absolutely have a brilliant role 
in some situations. You know, there are mothers and babies who are alive and well and thriving because we've had access to some of these quite complex medical interventions. Um, what's happening, though, in not only our birth culture, many in the Western world, is that the interventions themselves have shifted from what we might call being used for medical need to being used for either administrative convenience in the, you know, the big systems of the hospitals or uh, being used for sort of social choice because women and their partners can choose to access these interventions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what we have then in our birth culture prison is high, high intervention rates. And when I give you these stats, I'm pretty sure you and uh, people listening, and I'm, if, we, if I'm talking around the world, um, many countries have these same sort of high intervention rates. And you can, in, when you see how high they are, you can certainly draw the link between it can't possibly be that so many women and babies are so unwell that they all need this high level of intervention. So there's got to be some other other processes that are going on that cause these high intervention rates to come into being. Okay. So for instance, um, in Australia, so we talk about for a normal physiological childbirth, the mum and the baby are having a hormonal conversation with one another. The baby's sort of sending, it's more complex than I'm saying, but um, the baby's sending up some hormones, particularly oxytocin, to nudging that in the mother's body system, and it's oxytocin that causes the contractions eventually. So the the baby is more or less saying, I'm ready. And the mother is saying, yeah, yeah, darling, I'm ready. Let's let's rock and roll. Um, and so that would be called spontaneous onset of labor. Yeah, this exchange with the mum and the baby and then the mother's body system taking them on board. So in Australia at present, we only have 42% of babies, mothers and babies, starting labor spontaneously through that you know, a deep evolutionary process, you know, in human beings of the mum and the baby talking to one another at the hormonal level. Mm -hmm. um, and of that 42% who do start the labour spontaneously, that's what it's called, 30% um, of those labours are going to go on to be augmented. So that's augmentation is using a synthetic form of oxytocin, not oxytocin. In fact, I differentiate these two between queen oxytocin is the oxytocin coming from the mother and the baby's bodies, and this is important to understand this. Queen oxytocin is a multitasking hormone. It drives the contractions to open the mother's body for the baby to be born, but also queen oxytocin is the, is the hormone of love and tending and befriending and nurturing and caring and um, empathy and all of those beautiful human traits are all also mediated in our being through oxytocin in our bodies so that in labor, queen oxytocin that starts spontaneous labor between the mom and the baby is also preparing not only to open her body but to get her changed, ready to fall in love with this baby and to be bonded and nurturing that baby as well as the baby being ready to fall in love with us. So. But when we put synthetic oxytocin into the mother's body system, that floods the oxytocin receptors and sort of cancels out queen oxytocin. And then we have synthetic oxytocin, which is really a one action. It drives contractions. Mm -hmm. All of these other beautiful, sweet, loving vibes that we all want to be immersed in and these ba our babies to be immersed in. So this... As I'm reading through these stats, I hope that people listening are keeping this in mind and thinking about what this means. Um, we then have the induction rate um, is 35%. So this is where synthetic oxytocin is used from the get-go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Then we have the elective Caesar rate. So this is where there's no labor, um, but a Caesar is done and the baby is born. So again, in that situation, queen oxytocin is not part of that story that the baby is just born. So there, if you're trying to track queen oxytocin, then it's a bit hard to, for, to find her in those stats. I mean, as I said, sometimes augmentation is absolutely necessary. Sometimes induction is absolutely necessary. Sometimes elective seizure is absolutely necessary. But at these very high levels, 
this is not necessary. Well, if you're thinking that that's because women and babies need that those high levels of interventions, then you know we're doing quite poorly in terms of our health and well-being. So mm-hmm. there are other factors at play there. We then have the method of birth. So this is how the baby emerges from the mother. And so the vaginal birth rate is 63%. um, But only sort of 50% of them come without either forceps or vacuum to bring the baby out. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The forceps is is 5.2%. The vacuum rate is 7.9%. Higher in the private hospitals than it is in the public hospitals and so on. Um, then we have the cesarean births that happen. We have the ones that happen with no labor. And then we have the ones where the labor is started, but then it goes on to a, a, a Caesar. And that's um, 14%. So the overall Caesar rate in Australia is now 37%. Wow. Is that is that normal as it's always been or is that something that is very unusual now? It's building, building, building. I mean, we in Australia are something like 20, I think it's 26 out of 30 OECD countries in terms of the, the rate of seasons. We're, we're right up there at the, in the top layers of the numbers of seasons that we do. Okay. We do other comparable countries. Yeah. Okay, so why do you think that's so? That's a lot higher than it used to be. I mean, other than the health, poor health system that you can sort of under, um, guess a bit that that would be one of the causes. But is it? Is there a choice whether that you would rather have people would rather now have a cesarean rather than a natural birth? So some some part of those stats is yes that that's a choice. Okay. Um, some of it is that I'm going to jump a little bit here. (laughs) Um, So one of the other developments, which is can be brilliant, but also there's a big downside to it that a lot of women and couples aren't aware of, is the epidural. So the epidural, again, I was working in the birth scene before the epidural came in, and the epidural, of course, can just take away all of the pain so that the mother can be very comfortable. And as I said, they can be watching telly or or what have you while that whole process is happening. What is not understood by so many, though, it, it's it's like the epidural is, is offered sort of like it's a, yeah, it's just a, a normal way of doing it without people understanding the consequences of an epidural. And the epidural high consequences in t- terms of the mum and the baby's bodies not coping with them, particular babies, and then having to go to a Caesar. So a mother might be feeling, oh, I'd like an epidural because I can just be comfortable without understanding that it boosts the Caesar rate, it boosts the forceps or vacuum rate, so it's not without its um, consequences. And so that's a large part of the things that I educate about. So that's one thing. And so that pushes up that Caesar rate. Um, yeah, and I think the other thing I say in my workshops, you know, when I first came into working in birth, the Caesar rate, and this was in the 70s, the Caesar rate was somewhere between 8 and 10%. Yeah? Oh, wow. Okay. Which really was probably too low. You know, there are some, some babies who would really have benefited from a Caesar who were unable to have them, and that was mainly the Caesar rate was low because across the board, more generally, operative, you know, big operations were dangerous situations, not only Mm -hmm. all sorts of operations. So major operations were not done unless really, you know, somebody might die or something might happen, that it was worth having a go of an operation. I'm talking to Mm -hmm. you. We think yep. about that with birth, same. Caesar, quite a, you know, like a big major operation. And that if the mother or the baby were imperiled in some way, and it was felt that the balance of the danger of doing the Caesar, as opposed to the dangers that are being seen in what's happening with the labor, it was worth doing, having a go and doing the Caesar. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, across the board in medicine, not only in, in childbirth, but in medicine, 
operative te techniques of many, many different types have become safer and safer and safer. Yeah. So that that balance about when you think you might do an operation or whether you might, you know, feel like it's too dangerous to do an operation, that has changed entirely. So seizures have become, I mean, in some cases, they still can be, you know, it's a, it's a major operation, but they've become much more successful and seemingly to be, um, you know, always safe and just a simple thing to do. Mm -hmm. so, so the seizure rate has, has grown because of that, because of the, you know, the, the developments in operative procedures and seizures as well, in particular. Um, so that balance about, well, will we wait this out or see how things are going because it's too dangerous to do a seizure or do we jump in a bit earlier rather than waiting and seeing what's happening, we jump in with the seizure straight away because the seizure has become, when I say it's become a simple operation, I don't mean it's without its dangers, but it's become you know, a very well-practiced and procedure. So I'm hoping I'm explaining that in a way that's helpful, but the, that whole balance about making a choice about a seizure or not has shifted entirely because of just great developments in operative techniques across the board. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now, talking about sort of in the family sense of the, like these conversations that you would have um, in terms of everything when it comes to the whole childbirth process, what are some of the practices that you sort of would recommend to a family to prioritize during a childbirth? Okay, good. Um, so remember particularly that I am talking about, um, you know, the, the women and couples that come to me are wanting to have a go. Mm -hmm. They want to work with their bodies. So some of the things I'm going to say in answer to your question will, will be geared particularly to, you know, those people who feel like that. Um, but maybe I'll say one thing so it doesn't get lost that is important for anybody having a you know, giving birth to a baby, regardless of how they're choosing to or how it ends up, is that um, we talk about the golden hour. So I'm going forward, then I'm going to go back. Um, so the golden hour, or it's some yeah, often, I think that's probably the common term now. So to explain that, so in normal physiological childbirth, that's uninterfered with. The hormonal dance between the mother and the baby mean that the baby and the mother are both primed, if you like, to fall in love with one another or that strong bonding. And, of course, the human baby is, is uh, you know, if somebody doesn't really strongly bond with the baby, they, they, they don't, can't do too much for themselves for, for a while, so they need that love bond. Um, and so normal physiological childbirth sets that up because of the hormonal dance that's going on and the mum and the baby bond and then everybody else falls in love with it. We're all bonding. Um, but in a situation where either because medically it's necessary or because the birth unfolds in a way that leads to it becoming necessary or because women are choosing in the first place to want to have an elective Caesar. So if it goes to a Caesar, um, then what's hopefully becoming the normal practice is that this golden hour or this facilitating this bonding that 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 comes of its own accord from normal physiological childbirth to really facilitate this in this context. So this idea of bonding is that the baby is placed as soon as possible onto the mother's bare skin, onto her, her you know, we generally put the baby on the belly and the baby then that human baby does sort of nuzzle its way up to find, can smell the breast and is looking for the breast. So that that connection then to the, the first connection on the breast and the first feed. So we wanting to facilitate that without disturbance. Um, also that the mother, generally what happens is the mother will start to talk to the baby. There's that excitedness. And so, of course, the baby, the baby from about seven months in the womb its hearing is pretty well complete. I mean, it's sort of like it's hearing underwater, but its hearing is complete, and the baby is bonded to the mother's voice whilst the baby's in the womb, and so the mother's then talking and delighting in the baby and darling, 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 or the, the baby 
is attuned to the mother's voice as well as the skin-to-skin contact and the smell of the mother, as I mentioned earlier on. There's also another key part of it, of this early bonding, this very crucial early bonding from the baby's well-being, is eye contact. So the so the the mother's voice and then drawing the mother, the baby, and the baby looking and that beautiful eye contact. These are all part of the things that we want to have happen over this first hour to pay attention and be deliberate about those things. They happen as sort of if you like, instinctive processes in normal physiological childbirth. Mm -hmm. In a birth that's been disturbed for whatever reason, then these are things that we're now uh, really strongly making sure happens so that that mother and that baby are really bonding so strongly, even if the birth process itself has needed to unfold in a different way. Mm -hmm. And if I might say something about that, just to the dads, um, that the baby, you know, if the the father is talking a lot to the mother in those last months during the pregnancy. The baby is also starting to, you know, is bonding with the father's voice. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and so then when the baby is born, and of course in that beautiful, excited rush, you know, the mum and the baby, oh, darling, 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 you know, to the baby is sweetheart, all of the natural things. And fathers are saying those things as well. So the baby is also. The familiar voices that the baby is bonded to, the mother and the father, this is part of the process that settles the baby. You know, the baby's working hard during the labor, and then once it's born and comes out, it needs to sort of settle to go into a more relaxed situation. You see this in the baby's postures as they snuggle up onto their mother's breast and get up to them. So the parents' voices are part of that settling the baby, as well as the smell and the touch and so on. So dads can do a lot in by paying attention to that and knowing that their baby is bonding to their voice because there's a little bit of uh, research that's being done thinking about, like if a couple are working until late in the pregnancy and then when they come home they're just exhausted and they're listening, they're watching the telly or something and they're not doing much talking or the dad's not specifically talking to the baby, then ba- maybe the babies are not bonding so much to the dad's voice. Maybe... Maybe the mum is spending more time speaking to her work colleagues and the baby is hearing those voices rather than... So dads have got to get in there and read to their babies. Tell them stories. You know, I really want that bonding to be so helpful. Um, so the golden... So this is what I'm talking about, the golden hour. You know, so this is important. But to go back to other things that couples can do in preparation. So I want to ma- mention a... Um, an organization and then sort of a a whole beautiful understanding about how birth works and the physiology of birth works coming from America called spinning babies and spinning baby what a language is is evocative and spinning babies I mean just get onto their websites and get onto their stuff but in particular they are looking at you know modern women contemporary women because, you know, way back, way back, we were very physical. All through pregnancy, you'd be very physical on doing this and doing that and so on. And so the baby, the mother's body would be accommodating and the baby would be finding a good position to be in her body to be ready to be born. But for many of us in westernized cultures, you know, we're in more sedentary lifestyles and particularly maybe sitting at the computer for hours on end. And that this means that the mother's body is a bit more sort of cons- pregnant woman, um, more constrained into particular positions, which mean that her pelvis is not so fluid and not necessarily opening as it might otherwise. And babies are not getting themselves into the ideal positions to help work with a mother for the birth. So spinning babies is on the case about this and they they've got a lot of, they talk about the daily essentials that, that women ideally would be doing through particularly late pregnancy and encouraging that baby into a you know the best position to be ready for the birth. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's one thing to get on to. Um, another thing that I encourage couples to do, and in particular the, the mother, remember to be taking advantage of the baby's you know, hearing 
is to, in the last months of the pregnancy, well, they can do it all the way across the pregnancy, but certainly if they haven't, certainly by the late in pregnancy, to find some relaxation process, whether it's a yoga relaxation process, whether it's a relaxation process that they've done before in their lives, whether it's just that they love to listen to particular types of music that just really help them to chill out, whatever it is to, in those last months, to every you know, two or three times a week to spend some time with some particular music, with some particular relaxation process, and to become habituated to it. This then in the labor, and the partner needs to know what is the exact music, so not just changing the music up, but getting really habituated to a particular piece of music, so that if the mother is getting very distressed in the labor, that the partner will know which music to put on that can help to help her to chill out because she's done all that practice beforehand to become um, triggered by that music into relaxation. Not only that, but of course, remember that baby is also being habituated to that particular relaxation music. And once the baby's born, if again the mother, not only the mother, but the baby is also distressed and so on, that, that in using that as a tool to turn that music on, can also be helping to chill that baby out and so on. So that's one thing to put some good focus and energy into. Find a particular set of music or maybe it might have also a, I don't know, a yoga teacher talking you through or somebody's voice, but really the diligence of doing it regularly so that you become habituated is very, very important. So that's mm. one of the key things, yeah. Well, that sounds like a very... It sounds like a very interesting way to sort of be connected and stay connected to. And it's important, it sounds like, to stay connected to your body as well, to sort of really have that. I mean, I could not imagine going through that process and not sort of finding that connection to myself and also the connection to music. And I love how you did suggest music because that would have been one of the first things that I would have asked if you didn't mention it. Uh, so no, this sounds like it's such an important um, connection to have for both the father and the child. And that connection must be really difficult to sort of, it must be a little bit harder to connect as it's like the father's not around all the time. Or, I mean, the mother is always surrounded by the child for the first, during the process, during childbirth, during pregnancy. So it must be a lot more effort for the father to really put in to be able to have that connection. Yeah, I think it's what I found over the years when 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 the dads or the other mothers or, or even the grandparents or people around um, understand that the baby's hearing, you know, muffled, and, but really is connecting with the with the sounds that are around it from that seven months in the pregnancy in the in the womb. That yeah, a lot of dads really run with that and. Um, you know, feel like this is their sort of entry into building that, that starting to build that relationship with that baby. That, of course, they have a biological connection with the baby, but this more, it's more like an emotional connection with the baby. So it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So hopefully, lots of dads. Yes, hopefully, if you if you're. A- a person who's pregnant watching this send that do a little sneak send over to your partners and just make sure that they listen to every single thing that Ria is saying um and even the resources that you recommended I think it'll be so interesting um and I'll definitely have those in the link in the description down below if you're watching on YouTube as well um we're coming up to the end of the show and we love to end with a little open mic from you just to get to talk with the audience from you to them and it'll be so interesting interesting to see what kind of topic that you are wanting to talk about with us today <laughs> well i i'm not i'm not moving very far from from you know my core core thing and maybe i might just like to to talk about grandchildren and the the aspect of you know those extended family situations you know um, so I am the grandmother now to five grandchildren. And, wow. Uh, and um, just linking back to the birth, yeah. So I'm very close with my my I have three daughters and their their partners and the these grandkids. 
um, so many grandmothers, grandfathers' voices if they're around a lot during the pregnancy too. Um, I've had the privilege of being at all of the births of these grandchildren. Um, they've all been home births, so, and some of them, in fact, just in the room next door to where we're sitting. Um, so having been very strongly in their lives, as many grandparents are, has that one of the things about the nuclear family, of course, if it's just the mum and dad, well, it can be very you know, tiring and demanding, so having that extended family around. So that's so fantastic. Um, but the delights of grandmothering, who myself and my friends, you know, before we became grandparents, we were thinking, oh, you know, oh, life's so busy, you know, we've got this we're doing, we're doing this and we're doing that. And no, no, I'm not, you know, we're not ready for grandchildren yet. And yet, once you set your eyes upon them, <laughs> they weave their their little magic ways. Of course, could you imagine anything more delicious than then being with them and being present with them? And so, um, yes, I'd love to speak up that thing of if there are families listening, and and uh, to certainly not be afraid of grand the grandparenting role because it's such a delicious, delicious one. So I could say, say much more, but that's a nice little thing to finish on, I think. No, I think that is an amazing way to finish up on our conversation today. And I hope that everyone here enjoyed listening to the podcast as much as I did. I, I didn't know, I didn't realize how interested I could get talking about childbirth, especially for someone who has not experienced it themselves. Um, it's such a fascinating topic, especially the way that your body works and your brain works, just in understanding. Um, and just like the protective instinct that sort of kicks in very quickly as well. So thank you so much, Ria, for introducing this whole topic on the show. And I don't think we've spoken about it before. So I'm really excited to hopefully have more conversations on childbirth and pregnancy and the process that it goes on. Good. So delighted to be here to talk about, as you can tell, my favorite, favorite topic. <laughs> no, I, I can't tell it all. It's it's not, <laughs> it's not obvious to me at all. Um, if anyone would like to get if anyone in the audience would like to get in touch with you or to talk to the talk to you a bit more about this, is there a way that they're able to get into contact with you? Yes, I mean they could. Apparently, that if they Google my name, that'll really take them to my my website and so on. Um, yeah, I think that's that's the easiest way. Okay, so is there a contact sheet or contact form that they oh, could? Yes. My my. They'll be taken to my website and then when they get on the website, they'll they'll find ways to contact Yes. Okay, perfect. Well, I will have that also down in the description below for anyone who is interested. And yeah, I, I hope you guys enjoyed this podcast. Thank you so much, Ria, again for joining me. And we will see you guys in the next episode. Bye. You've been listening to All Together, the Family Science Insights podcast produced by Family Science Labs a division of LMSL, the Life Management Science Labs. More episodes are available from 10 life management perspectives and can be found by searching LMSL on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and other podcasting apps available on your smartphone. If you enjoyed this episode, please rate, share, and subscribe to our channel so that other people can find it and we can continue to provide quality content. More of our work can be found on our website at fa.lmsl.net where you can join our movement. I'm Dina Sargent, and thanks for tuning in.